this episode, I got the chance to speak to Catherine D. Sullivan, an oceanographer, geologist, and a former NASA Space Shuttle astronaut who helped launch the Hubble Space Telescope. You can find out more about Kathy via her own podcast at kathysullivanexplores.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Kathy Sullivan. I bill myself as a scientist, astronaut, and explorer. After an academic career training formally as an oceanographer, I found myself making an abrupt turn to NASA in the early uh, batch of space shuttle astronauts uh, and have a chance to fly three times in space, but never quite forsook all of my Earth science interests. So I've managed to go back and forth between oceanic pursuits and space pursuits throughout my career. Fantastic. I mean, it's, it's brilliant to have you on the podcast, Kathy. Thank you so much for coming on. It's amazing. Um, now, um, the the reason our, our paths have crossed really is is because of the sort of latest news in your career or your, your sort of latest activities, which is um, your, your involvement in uh, the the scenic eclipse too, which is, as I understand it, is like a, a luxury cruise liner. I, mean, I think it's being launched around about the time the podcast comes out, and then it's christening ceremonies a few a few weeks after uh, the, the the podcast comes out. Um, how how did you how, how did you come to get involved in that? Yeah, I'm quite delighted to have been invited to be the godmother for Scenic Eclipse 2. But the wonderful thing, well, there's lots of wonderful things about godmothers of ships, I think, especially for someone who's made much of her career on, around, and under the ocean. So um, you get to uh, bestow the name officially on the vessel. Uh, that will happen at a ceremony in Malaga, Spain, in early June of this year. Uh, you know, make some nice, appropriate remarks about the vessel uh, and, you know, where, where you hope she may sail and the grand adventures you expect she will take people on. Uh, scenic, scenic Eclipse 2 is best described as a luxury adventure yacht. So think the the outward style of a you know, a mega yacht that you might see at a fancy port in the Mediterranean, but an adventure yacht. So equipped with a, an expedition team that knows of what they speak with respect to geography and geology and the places that you're at. Um, Zodiacs to ferry you on and off the ship to shore for, you know, detailed excursions. And really quite notably, a Triton submersible, passenger submersible, and a helicopter. So you've got the ship as a, you know, ships are fabulous exploration platforms. They can move you around, you know, significant areas. And of course, three quarters of our planet is ocean. So as the access platform to the ocean itself and to interesting bits of land, a ship is ideal. And then to be able to extend that reach and extend your experience by taking you underwater. So, you know, the ocean stops being just this lovely blue carpet that you're moving over and you have the opportunity to really come to understand it a bit as a, a vibrant, complex, dynamic, and most importantly of all, a living realm. Uh, most most of the biosphere on this planet is actually the ocean, not the bits that we live in. Uh, and then a helicopter you know, to take you, you know, beyond the sort of two-dimensional postcard view of a shore that you might get from the deck of a ship, the aerial view can give you such a more powerful sense of how how the context all hangs together, right? The situation of the, for example, the village to the sea, to the mountains, to the rivers, to get above that a bit and be able to see that uh, from that elevated view very much enhances your understanding of how a place works. Yeah, I, I mean... I I, I can see why you, why you're sort of perfect perfect for it in, in those in those two aspects because obviously of your your career you know um below below sea level and and above and some some somewhat above sea level um it, it, it wasn't that long ago that that, that you had a, a a particularly a particularly deep dive was wasn't it that was about, was it about about two years ago was it uh, it was in 2020 that I had the opportunity to dive uh, again in a Triton produced submersible to the deepest point in the world's ocean. The, it's known as the Challenger Deep, and it lies in the famous Marianas Trench, which extends you know, south from Guam, sort of roughly south and a bit to the direction of the Philippines. How did you get involved in that? Because I think it, it made you the, the, the first woman to reach the, the deepest known spot in, in, in the ocean. Um, how, how did you get involved in that, in that particular adventure? And yeah, I mean, the, the obvious question is, what was it like? <laughs> Uh, the, the Challenger deep dive actually made me, uh, officially, according to the folks at Guinness, the most vertical person in the world. <laughs> if you 
account for the deepest point in the world's ocean and the hundreds of miles above the Earth, uh, uh, in particular on the Hubble Space Telescope deployment flight. And and yes, secondarily, the first woman to reach the bottom of the Challenger Deep. But I, I rather like the most vertical person in the world myself. You know, rather like the invitation to be Scenic Eclipse 2's godmother, uh, the invitation to join Victor Vescovo on his Ring of Fire expedition in 2020 was, you know, unsought after, unsolicited, it just came completely out of the blue. So it's really all, it's all down to Victor and all kudos to Victor to have this expansive sense of, you know, now that he had, he personally with his own funds built and assembled what he called a Hadal exploration system. The Hadal zone are the deepest bits of the ocean, 6,000 meters or deeper, 20,000 feet or deeper. Um, you would think it's not very much of the ocean. And it's, if you look at the area on a map, it's maybe 4 or 5% of the surface area of the ocean. But if you look at the volume of the ocean, a huge volume of the ocean lies below those depths. So Victor had equipped a, a surface ship that could carry the submersible around. He'd given it the best sonar that's ever been put on a civilian ship so he could pinpoint exactly where the really deep bits were. Uh, many of these regions have not been well mapped at all, some not mapped in the least. And then he commissioned the building of the first submersible ever built that can go reliably and repeatedly to any depth of the ocean. And in 2020, uh, he wanted to expand the value of that by really building a scientific component. So he engaged uh, Dr. Alan Jameson, then out of Newcastle, now out of Western Australia, to be the chief scientist and look at these deep regions, say, what's not known? What do we want to try to understand? Where do we want to go? And he also wanted to raise awareness, I think, about these super deep regions of the ocean. So as he set out on his 2020 voyages from Monaco and then through the Suez Canal and into the Indian Ocean and Pacific, he made a point of inviting along on a dive some figure who would help raise the profile, raise the awareness of the deep dives in the deep ocean in each of those regions. So he took His Serene Highness Albert of Monaco down to the deepest point in the Mediterranean. He took a Saudi citizen to the deepest point in the Red Sea, the first Saudi to ever dive deep into the ocean. Uh, when it came to getting back to the Challenger Deep, uh, he, his thoughts, I'm told, his thoughts were, well, there's really never been a fully proper oceanographer experienced that dive. And, and there's definitely not been a woman. It's been basically engineers and, you know, film producers and people like that. And so that's, he started asking around, said it's time there be a woman and an oceanographer. Maybe that's two people. Maybe that's one. What do you think? And apparently a bunch of people said, oh, it's one. And her name is Kathy. And so he shot me an email and said, uh, by the way, I'm going back, and um, I'd like to invite you to come along and dive to the Marianas Trench if you're interested. Which <laughs> was a pretty easy answer. <laughs> I can imagine it's not an, it's not an email you get every day. Um, no, <laughs> especially. <laughs> I mean, I suppose if you've been sort of seeking it and you know lobbying for it and whatnot, you might have some bit of an expectation. But this was like. I had followed Victor's exploits in 2019, getting the sub out and, you know, putting it through its paces. Uh, but just as, you know, someone interested in whoever's exploring the deep sea, not with any kind of thought that it would ever come around and touch me. When I was when I was reading about this, one of the things that sort of immediately sprang to mind that I wanted to ask you was, did you notice, were, were there any um, similarities between being that far deep in the ocean and being in Earth orbit, I mean, specifically thinking about sp space walking and what, what I would imagine would be this sort of very con constrictive feeling of, of doing a spacewalk. Yeah, there are some broad similarities between going deep, very deep into the sea and out into space, whether that's in a vehicle like the space shuttle or in a spacesuit. But, you know, there are the primary ones are technical, right? I mean, human beings really only survive in a pretty narrow range of conditions. We need we need a certain minimum amount of oxygen and minimum pressure of, of atmosphere to breathe uh, and to keep our the tissues in our bodies stable. We need, you know, you need to scrub out the CO2 that you exhale. If you're going into space, you need to do that in some kind of shell 
that protects your body from the vacuum of space. If you're going deep in the ocean, you need to do that in some kind of shell that protects you from the extraordinary crushing pressures outside. So in a spacecraft, the pressure inside the vehicle is usually one atmosphere, just what you would have in a house at sea level. Outside, it's zero. It's like (laughs) seriously zero. When you go diving deep in the sea, if you go all the way as deep as the deepest point, the Challenger Deep, the pressure inside the sphere is, again, like your living room at sea level. You could be wearing shirt sleeves. It's all just fine. The pressure outside is 1,100 times that. So, you know, crushing, as Victor likes to describe it, imagine a hippopotamus, what well, hippopotamus in stiletto heels standing on just one stiletto heel on every square, one hippopotamus each on every square inch of the outside of your vessel, 16,000 pounds per square inch. So you want to keep that seriously out. <laughs> Absolutely. Just coming back to the um, the subject of, of, of spacewalking, I mean, I have to ask you about that. I mean, what was, I mean, what was it? I, I often wonder um, with, with, with the, the idea of, of, of spacewalking, um, what's it like um, actually sort of being that close to space, if you know what I mean? Because you can actually see space with your naked eye. And, and, and what does the earth look like? Yeah, sensor, your view of the earth is not terribly different from inside a space shuttle or inside the space station than outside on a spacewalk, except... There is no window frame. I mean, you're in you're in a, a bubble helmet. The bubble helmet has uh, opaque visors on it because the the sun is so harsh uh, at, with no atmosphere, no, no air scattering it. So you do usually pull some visors around so you don't just blast your eyes with super bright sun. But basically, it's just you. I mean, you're not sticking your head into some window to get a good view. It's just there. But it's... You know, the space suit is its own spaceship. It's a spaceship that is just shaped like your body. It has it miniature versions on your backpack of all the pumps and fans and things that make the inside of a space shuttle or a space station work. Uh, so you're pilot in command of your very own spaceship at that point, uh, and usually maneuvering hand over hand. Uh, if you, one of the fun things is uh, when you're maneuvering in a space suit, on handrails that are mounted around around the outside just for that purpose. Uh, your, your arms are not very limber in, a, in most spacesuits. You don't have a big range of motion for your arms. So as you're moving along, as if you were a kid on a jungle gym, your hands are usually within, they're, they're within about 12 inches of your face. They're maybe somewhere between nose level and chin level. They're really in a close little space. And that's kind of all you can see because the space shuttle or the station that you're moving on is quite big. So you're just, you have a face full of spaceship usually when you're moving around. If you want to see the earth, you can't just turn your head. Your head turns inside the helmet. So if you just, if you just twist your neck, all you would see is the inside of your helmet, which is nice to look at occasionally, but not a terribly good view. If you want to see the earth, you actually have to pivot your body away from the structure that you're moving on. And and what was amusing to me is I found when I did that, I found that it felt it felt as much like I moved the space shuttle out of my way as as that I pivoted my body. I mean, I had my hand on the space shuttle right in front of my face at one point and then I take say my left hand right in front of my face is the space shuttle and then I swung my left arm out like straight out to my side, but it felt like I moved the shuttle out of the way, <laughs> which was kind of, oh, look at that. I can move a spaceship with one hand. That's very cool. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. I mean, when you're doing a spacewalk, obviously you've, you've got a job to do. And so you're, you're, you're concentrating on that job, but is there sort of like a, a, a conflict between professional astronaut and scientist who's got a job to do and just human being who's just going, this is absolutely crazy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a spacewalk in the in the real world, a spacewalk is not a space stroll, right? It's it's going outside to do something and usually something that matters. It might be a repair or 
you know, something scientific, but it's it's not a lark. You're not just going you're not just going out for the view. And it, the way I sum up that tension of you're outside and you 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 could happily just gawk forever, but you do have some things to do. <laughs> uh, my simple summation is. Uh, it, it it turns out to not be that hard to manage that because at least I was always mindful of if you ever want to do another spacewalk, you'd probably better do this one well. So the rest of that and how it works out depends very much on what the task is, on the kinds of spacewalks that have assembled the space station and maintained the space station. It's very often the case that you know one one of the spacewalkers has taken up position and has a little some bit of a while to wait while something is delivered. So, you know, the other guy is moving something around or preparing something for them. So there's a you first, me first um, sequence, oftentimes the choreography. And once, once you're established and safely set at a place, if you're just waiting for other buddy to come up with tools or whatever, that is a moment that you can, you know, take and take in where you are. The moment that I had, we only had two moments of that on uh, the spacewalk I did, which was a fairly short one, frankly. First was very shortly after we left the airlock, went to the little toolkit uh, and rigged up and picked up all the bits that we needed to take with us towards the tail end of the shuttle. Uh, and our commander, we, Dave Lisa and I were the spacewalkers. We were both rookies, first flights, first spacewalks. And our commander, Bob Crippen, ordered us to stop for a moment. We're out, we're set, we're tethered, we've got our tools. And before you just go hustling back and, you know, ticky-boo, jump into the job, stop for a minute. You know, pivot back, take a look, take a look around, take in where you are. Because the experience of moving on a real spacewalk is so very similar to the training experience of doing all those motions underwater. That that underwater tank experience is a very, very good preparation for a real spacewalk. So much so, Bob Cripp felt that unless he stopped us, from gave us permission to stop for a moment and take in the fact that this is not a swimming pool, there's no water around you, look, there are no scuba divers, you know, hanging around to keep an eye on you, uh, that blue thing up there is not the surface of the water, that is the earth. You know, so take a moment and take it all in. You, you work really hard for a long time to get to that point. So you know, give yourself that moment. And then at the really coming to the very end of the spacewalk, uh, I was coming up the left hand, the port side sill or length of the shuttle and had to cross over to the starboard side to do something. Uh, and we realized when we were planning everything, that that moment of me crossing the payload bay would be a great scene to film with the IMAX camera we had aboard. Because otherwise, most of our spacewalk was happening, the, the task we were doing was way at the back end of the space shuttle. And if you took an IMAX scene or image of that, you'd just see two itty, itty, itty bitty little white dots way back there somewhere. So that was not going to be a great scene. But at that moment, we were going to have Dave up pretty close to the windows on the port sill and me right sort of centered in the windows with a good view of the earth. And so I started making my way along that path. And John McBride was our IMAX camera operator. He, he was just finishing getting the shot set up. He wasn't, wasn't quite ready as I started trucking across from the port to the starboard. And so he said, you know, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'll, I'll let you know when you can move. And so for some moments. I mean, it, it felt like a pleasantly long time to look around and look down and see the earth sliding between my boots. I, it, <laughs> maybe it was 90 seconds. I, don't, I have no sense of how, how much time it really was. But that, you know, that's, that is my most memorable uh, glimpse from the spacewalk was my hands above my head. I felt like I was kind of hanging from a tree limb in a backyard, except it was 200 miles down to the earth and there was the blue of the Caribbean sliding between my my boots. <laughs> it must have just been absolutely incredible. I mean, the other aspect of of that spacewalk and also um, your your career in space and indeed of, of, of your colleagues was, I suppose, you and so many of the other women astronauts were really blazing a trail um, because up, up until the, the the shuttle era, really, 
U- US space flight had, had had been very male dominated. Do you, did, were you thinking that at the time? And, and looking back, do you do, do, do you think about that? I never really thought that much about it, uh, and don't dwell on it that much. Uh, Go be the first woman to do X was not any kind of factor in why I was interested in applying and becoming an astronaut. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have cared if I was the eight hundred thousandth woman to do something. It's that you know your first experience of something counts completely. It, it really doesn't matter where you are in the list of whoever else has done it. It's at so that was never something, in fact, that the six of us uh, women in that class and the three African-Americans as well uh, had not a shred of thinking about pursuing this for that reason. We just it really never gave it a thought, never gave it a thought. And, and I certainly don't hang my hat on that. I mean, what, what I want to hang my hat on is the track record I built, the contributions I made, the, the substantive things I've done in life, not I got to the top of this list or that list that you know some fan club list um but but on the other hand the, the singularity of being one of the first women and and doing the spacewalk uh, that you know that does draw attention to me in a way that I appreciate only because it has given me so many opportunities to hopefully inspire uh and connect with other young people and you know point out to them that you know when I was their age sitting in their classroom seat I would never have imagined what might be before me. Uh, it just came as it came, and I took it as it came. So don't, you know, whatever, whatever you're thinking about yourself when you're age 11, realize <laughs> there's a lot more to the world. You know, believe in some potential. You know, stay a bit eager, stay a bit daring, be a bit adventurous. Uh, believe in yourself. You know, try things. Try something. <laughs> don't you know? Don't edit yourself beforehand. Certainly, certainly, don't let anybody else edit you, and say, "Oh, oh, you can't do that." You know, w- women don't do that, or what, whatever kind of people like you don't do that. Well, you know, that's their opinion, uh, and they will, of course, be loud about their opinion. Uh, but it's it's just that it has has no weight unless you give it weight. They're not in control of the universe. They're not in control of you. So you know, thanks for your opinion. You can be quiet now and. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're you're sort of um, mentioning those like um, mission milestones and and, and and scientific accomplishments. I mean, and w- one one of which obviously is um, your your part in the deployment of the of the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, given given what it's given us since since it was deployed, do, do you sometimes lean back and just go, "I had a hand in that," and that, that and that's that's absolutely that's awesome. I, I absolutely hang my hat on being part of Team Hubble, two hundred percent to be to play any substantive role in helping make that happen. And 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 actually, the primary role that I played, along with my uh, crewmate on that flight, Bruce McCann, was it's a largely invisible role. I mean, we were we were the spacewalkers. Our job on the deployment flight was not. I didn't do the deployment myself. Steve Hawley was the guy driving the the, crane, the robotic crane around and holding Hubble. Uh, Bruce and I were basically the emergency backups. There were a handful of things that could go wrong while we were setting Hubble up to let it go. And if any of them went wrong, they had to get fixed quite quickly, lest you drain the telescope's batteries to a dangerous state. So our job was to be spring-loaded to hop in our spacesuits and go out and, you know, crank out a solar array that didn't unfold properly or crank out an antenna. Um, And as it happened, one solar array didn't unfold properly. And we jumped in our spacesuits and we're, I mean, we're in the airlock. We've dumped out half the air. We're about to go outside. I've got the wrench in my hand. We're ready to go do that. Uh, When uh, somewhere, someone on the ground found a software fix. So for Bruce McCandless and Kathy Sullivan, after for me, five years of working on the telescope, Bruce and I were dedicated to Hubble for five years. Bruce had worked on it off and on even a bit before that. Here we are, the two of two of the five people on the crew that have the most time experience and invested in the telescope and were locked in the airlock with no view at all Ugh. when it was deployed. So, you know, that I mean, the sort of celebrated astronaut tales of Hubble are, of course, the crews, the five different crews that went up and repaired it. Uh, what Bruce and I did, along with 
a bevy of under engineers is we we designed, developed, built, tested, improved all the tools that those later crews used. So, you know, that it's the mechanic that fixes your car that gets all the kudos, not the guy that put the wrench in the toolbox, right? But we were the guys that put the wrenches in the toolbox. <laughs> uh, yeah, when you sort of look back at the shuttle era, because it, it, it sort of get, it sort of makes me think about just just how important the the space shuttle era was. I mean, you think about people like 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 May Jemison and yourself and and uh, and Sally Ride and Bruce McCandless and all and all the people and all the adventures and and all the things that that the space shuttle did. It it sort of feels hard to believe that it came to an end because it seems like the sort of thing that 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 surely that surely that was just going to go on forever because it's just it's just been so unprecedentedly so so unprecedented how how do you feel now when 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 you when you look back at the shuttle era and especially the fact that it did come to an end yeah it's uh yeah i i can toy with both sides of that equation i i think you know if it had been possible really politically for nasa to build you know, one or maybe two space shuttles of the design we know and fly them five or 10 flights and learn some lessons about the design, how to use it, and then take those lessons and build the one you really want to make a fleet out of, right? So the shuttles that actually were built were, they were conceived of as an, an everyday pickup truck that you could go you know, back and forth to town with as much as you wanted, but they were designed to the, the nth degree like top fuel drag racers. You know, top fuel drag racer, you blast that vehicle down the track, you rebuild the engine after every race. The shuttle was pushing all of its performance capabilities in in so many systems at the limit all the time. So it you couldn't run it like you do your everyday pickup truck or personal car. Your personal car is not pushing any of the design factors anywhere near a limit, right? That's why we can, you know, change spark plugs and toy with it ourselves. It's designed to be kind of operating in a, right in this middle sweet spot, simple part of a performance envelope. It's not an engine that's working at its max, that kind of thing. Shuttle was at the max all the way. So, you know, I personally would have wished that we'd done designed the max vehicle, learn a bit more about it, and then come back, pull the design back a bit and say, you know what, we need this kind of a truck. Uh, or maybe we need two trucks, one that can do these edge things and one that can do the everyday things. So, but we, you know, we did what we did. So, so what did the shuttle that we did build and operate for a couple decades, what did it do? Uh, it taught a boatload of design and operating lesson, lessons. It taught a boatload of mid-duration living and complex working in low Earth orbit environments. It trained a huge raft of young engineers, young flight controllers, astronauts who got you know, multiple exposures to complex operations. So if you look now at the commercial space startup companies, Sierra Space, Axiom, uh, SpaceX, anywhere, you will find a raft of shuttle era veterans who didn't just get to you know, operate one flight or fly one flight. They saw a, a great variety of operations, of styles. They learned, they learned a lot about what kind of operation takes what kind of capability and, and got seasoned, like really seasoned on real world cutting edge space operations. And they're now plowing that into many, many, many other companies. It's being plowed in very significant and important ways into space policy, into you know, federal agency plans. So, you know, it it had its life, but it generated, it spawned a whole nother generation of really seasoned, seasoned and imaginative space professionals who will now build upon that and take those those lessons in new form to the next stage. You know, the history of technology, the history of aviation, it's that over and over again. <laughs> Go to a really good aviation museum You'll see some airplane standing there, and if, if it's got a good explanatory sign, it will say something like, you know, never got beyond high-speed taxi tests before it was retired. And then the next paragraph will say, but the landing gear design was so robust it was used here, or this part of the design was so good it was used there. So 
the the bits of experience, the bits of design and, and fabrication lessons that are learned, they're like seeds that seed the next and next after things. And the shuttle era has seeded a raft of what we're seeing around us today in this kind of new emerging space age. How do you feel about this this sort of new new era of, of space flight and companies like SpaceX and you know um, what's what's going on? Are, do, does it excite you? Yeah, I'm pretty excited following all the new developments in you know this so called new space age. You know, it's a, it seems a pretty frothy time. Lots of big companies shifting gears and repositioning. Uh, a lot of small and new companies making different plays, trying different forays. It's, you know, not not all of the plays and efforts that are underway will work, right? That these are, we're watching a major phase of experimentation about, you know, what kind of, what kind of project, what kind of technical approach, what kind of financing, which companies will, will end up, you know, hitting the sweet spot, you know, getting the, the, the contract term or the engagement that, moves them along and lets them mature. And, uh, but, you know, it kind of reminds me of the early days of personal computers where there was, you know, many more, many more companies around trying to take niches or occupy different parts of the space. And, you know, you, you just got to watch and see how it evolves. But it's, uh, I, what really excites me most and I find most interesting is that the proliferation, I mean, just the companies that are working on variations of building and operating a commercial space station. It's, you know, and they're, they are seeded by NASA. I mean, it's in NASA's, the United States policy and, and NASA's interest to try to help jumpstart some of this, right? So uh, NASA's very much involved in kind of grub staking some of these early companies to give them a shot, give them some some funding, some capital to work up their designs, Again, and there the variety of them, the variations among them, the different techno. Yeah, there's a broad similarity, of course, right? They all have the same challenge: keep pressure in, keep people safe, you know, supply food, water. You know, got, y'all got to do that. But there are, you know, there are variations to a degree in how the different companies are trying to approach that. And you know, I think that that radiation to a wider set of experiments, a wider set of exploratory efforts is it's healthy you don't know which one's going to pan out it's you know you got to throw a lot of things at the wall and and live with them and work with them long enough that you really learn what is this one good for what is this one's weaknesses yeah so you want you want some runtime on all these things so i you know i want many of them to get enough funding to go several steps down the road so you get a bevy of lessons out in in the world for others to harvest. It, if I have any bit of a reservation about all of that, it's that you know one factor in how we got to this point at the United States anyway is that you know NASA's remit as a government agency and a civilian funding agency was really always to produce, design, develop, create new things, and and largely leave it largely leave it in the public domain. So anybody could pick up that good idea that came out of that NASA project and try something else with it. And of course, as you get more private capital involved and private companies involved, the, the, the need and the incentive to put a fence around what you've done and make sure that only you secure the benefits from that, or if someone else wants to use it, you get to you sell it to them and recoup some of your money. That's a perfectly valid model, but what it does mean is, you know, little little kids can't get in, right? The the threshold to get in the game and try something starts to rise and and narrow the range of clever young people that can come up with a new idea and, and have access to the means of pursuing that idea. It's it's funny because that that sort of rings a bell even with me. I mean, as as somebody who works in media and. For, for journalists, as far as NASA is concerned, everything's free. Just go for it. Videos, data, right. images, it's all there. Just use it. Go go for it. It's, and it's amazing. Right. Right. Educate, inform, inspire, create a movie, create a toy. I don't care. Just keep keep it in the popular imagination. Help. Yeah. Yeah. Go. All the, all the information you want to go develop a lecture set about planetary sciences, here it is. Yeah. Or about spacecraft design, here it is. And you know we should 
we should not underestimate the importance, uh, the scale of the role that that has played in incentivizing and attracting and training you know, wave after wave of young space professional, right? You can you can do a freshman engineering course on a case study on a for real NASA system because it's all just out there. Yeah. Pick it up, take it apart, and learn how they did it. Just to finish our chat, I was I wanted to get your thoughts on on well what what where this is all going. Um basically the the prospect of humans returning to the moon and potentially going going on to Mars. I mean, are you are you watching it with sort of as much excitement as everyone? I suppose, I suppose you're watching it from a place of even more excitement because you you sort of know it, it, you, you've got maybe a better view of the, of the context or, uh, surrounding uh, uh, Artemis and, and, and Mars missions. Yeah, I, I think yeah, my understanding and awareness of the technical, uh, three, three factors. There's the technical constructs and concepts that are being brought into play for Artemis and NASA's you know, moon and then Mars. There's the whole you know, the policy arena. I mean, I've spent a lot of my career in the national policy sphere, you know, shaping the ground rules or the provisions for operating in the ocean or managing climate risk or or space policy. So that's also shifting as this regime shifts from predominantly NASA government-led and driven to, uh, I, let me call it NASA-fostered, but with the aim of increasingly you know, privately directed, corporately directed, but also, you know, knowing, I mean, I, I don't, I do not know the name of every single astronaut in the astronaut office anymore, as I used to do for many years, but I know a number of them. And so there's also that personal, you know, which of the f- folks that I know gets which slot and is going to go have what experience. And uh, Artemis too is a great case in point for that. Uh, Christina Cook is on the crew. Uh, Christina was selected into the astronaut corps in something like 2015-ish, maybe 16 timeframe, when I was the administrator of NOAA, and she was a NOAA employee. So I had the fun of sending a personal congratulatory note as the head of NOAA to this young person at a field station in American Samoa who had just gotten tapped to be an astronaut. Um, and now she's you know tapped for the the Artemis flight, so you know it's that that sort of fun personal connection as well. So it's uh, I, I'm following it pretty closely on on sort of all of those dimensions simultaneously. Um, the policy arena of this new space era is you know fascinating and complex, and you know something something that's really going to have to get sorted out eventually, because there's several really key aspects of all these envisioned advances that it's, there are real tangles ahead for how is that going to work. There's, uh, you know, these mega constellations of thousands of satellites to deliver internet seamlessly anywhere on the planet without a ground infrastructure. Brilliant idea. You've got to love it. The trick is, all of those signals, the signals that command and control the satellite and you know, my, your cell phone signal up to the satellite and back the satellite, those operate in a certain set of wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's a, there's a, just a certain, certain region in the microwave region that the atmosphere will let pass through. It's a window that's transparent to those kind of wavelengths. Much of the, a lot of the other, our atmosphere is a wall to a lot of other radiation, but that one bit there is a window that this stuff can get through. And now everybody wants gazillion megabits in that same window. It's a real estate problem Mm. that's really not solved yet. So there's a bit of Wild West. If you put a satellite up there and it uses some of that wavelength, I guess that's too bad for the next guy. Uh, and it's a global issue because there's only one, you know, these things circle the whole globe. So when your bird is over Europe, uh, somebody in Europe who didn't plan on being interfered with by you is suddenly now having to deal with your signal. So there's the, the spectrum problem is a challenge. There's property rights issues. Companies are going to go out and make investments. There's ownership issues, property right issues. How do you solve disputes between? None of, I mean, it's really like the old Wild West of the United States is, you know, the town ends here and there's nothing beyond that. And if you can get there, go on and have fun and, you know, figure, figure out the little skirmishes as you go kind of thing. So that's going to be really 
quite fascinating, but has the potential also to be quite fraught and potentially even bring some, you know, geopolitical um, conflict and contest into play when, you know, Russia wants to do this and China wants to do that and Europe wants to do this and the United States wants to do that. And where do you, so where do we go to sort this out? <laughs> there isn't a place. We haven't agreed a place. I don't even want there to be a place. Yeah, it's, it's going to be its angle. That's going to be, that's going to be like watching an old Western movie for a while. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. Lots to sort of look forward to and also be concerned about for the future, I suppose, in terms of in terms of space flight. The future is not something that just happens. It is something that is created by lots of decisions and actions by at least the, the future with respect to, you know, human life and human society. It's uh, things we think and want and do, uh, they shape it. And we each sort of are a little bit like one blind person feeling our own way forward at a time. Absolutely. Well, yeah, uh, Kathy, thanks, thanks for coming on the the uh, podcast and, and speaking just today and sharing 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 your memories and your and your thoughts and um, good luck with the boat launch <laughs> in, in a few weeks. Thank time. you. And I uh, hope, hope that all goes well for you. And I, I hope I get to speak to you again, maybe get in the podcast again at some point in the near future. Who knows? Um, but yeah, th- uh, thanks again for coming on. My pleasure, and great talking to you. Mm-hmm.